evening. Um, having a quorum of our golf course conservation restriction committee, I'm calling the meeting to order at 7.05. And the first thing on our agenda is introductions. But first, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming. I know tonight was complicated because there were three other meetings dealing with a golf course at the same time. So we're happy so many chose to come here. And um, we're being televised, so we hope that um, you know other people who couldn't come because of the planning board or the golf course committee meeting you know, can watch this later. I'd like to thank Doreen Ferguson, who um, graciously is filming us tonight. And I'd like to introduce the committee. And I'll just ask everyone, starting with um, I'm David, yeah, David Candela from the Recreation Command. Ed Pearson, I'm one of the abutters. Andre Gordon from the Golf Course Committee. Ben Smith from the Conservation Commission. And Vice Chair. And Vice Chair. And I'm Freddie Gillespie from the Open Space Preservation Commission and the Chair. And I'm Beth Rosenblum, the oh, South Borough Conservation Administrator. And joining us tonight is attorney Luke Legere. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I put my French hat on. I you should do. have the accent. Right? Legere, um, who is working with town council to help draft the CR, and he's been attending all our meetings and has been a great help to us. So the first thing I want to um, have is a brief overview of what is a CR, because there's a lot of people who don't exactly understand that. And Luke said he'd give us his best non-legal lawyer talk <laughs> so that we can understand what he's saying. I shall do my best. Luke Legere, McGregor and Legere, as Freddie said, I'm special counsel working with the town of Southborough to help in the drafting of this conservation restriction. So before we dive into detail on what this particular conservation restriction is and what we're trying to do with it, uh, we thought it might be useful for you just to get an overview of what a conservation restriction is generally. So very briefly, uh, being a lawyer, that's hard for me, <laughs> as brief as I possibly can. Uh, I think the easiest way to think of a conservation restriction is to maybe think of what a property owner is essentially giving up. If you're a property owner and you own your property in the legal term is fee, uh, fee simple, that means essentially you have all rights to do as you please with your property, anything above it and below it to a reasonable uh, height and depth below. There are ways you can encumber your property or limit your, your abilities to use it, your rights in the property. For instance, you might grant someone an easement. So you still own the property, you own the dirt on the ground, but maybe you grant your neighbor an easement to be able to walk across your property to get to a pond that's on the other side of your property. So you still own the land, but now you have a little bit less in terms of your rights and what you can do in that strip of land that's been eased to your neighbor. You can't block it, you can't plant trees in there, you can't plant shrubs in there. You need to keep it clear for your neighbor. A conservation restriction is essentially the same thing. You own a piece of land, you own a parcel, and you want to restrict what you can do with that property moving forward and typically that's for conservation purposes, hence the name conservation restrictions. So what that essentially means is that a property owner who is typically referred to as a grantor, so in the draft, that there's a copy of the draft, uh, excuse me, draft conservation restriction at the, at the back. If you haven't grabbed it, please, please do grab that and take a look. The grantor in this case will be the town of Southborough. The town will own this property. Uh, the, as the owner, they are the grantor, they are granting two parties, and we're still figuring out exactly who that's going to be, but in the draft we have right now, it's drafted as the Towns Conservation Commission and Sudbury Valley to trustees holding the conservation restriction as co-grantees. So essentially the town, in granting a conservation restriction to those grantees, is giving up its rights to develop the land. That's basically what a conservation restriction is doing. We're essentially putting that land in conservation in conservation in perpetuity, so that moving forward forever and ever, um, you're very much limited in what you can do. And we'll get into detail uh, a little later down the agenda as to exactly how we do that, but essentially what a conservation restriction does is to prohibit any and all uses virtually associated with the property, certainly anything to do with development, use of motor vehicles, things like that. Um, prohibits everything, and then you think about what purposes you have for the conservation restriction. Maybe it's to build really great hiking trails. Maybe you have a beautiful piece of land that has great potential for hiking. 
and that's what people love to use it for. So then you, in a later section of the conservation restriction, sort of claw back the rights to, say, build and maintain hiking trails, put up signage associated with those trails and so forth. So as I said, we'll get into specific details to exactly what we're doing here um, shortly, but basically the process that we've all been involved with here over the past uh, several weeks is to go ahead and draft this in a way that is protecting the fairly um, unique set of circumstances that we find ourselves in with this particular um, piece of property, which is to allow for its continued use as a golf course, which again is pretty unique in these circumstances. Typically that's not a right that you'd be allowed to continue with once you grant a conservation restriction on a parcel of land. Um, as well as passive recreational uses, so things like walking, hiking, jogging, uh, those types of things out there. Uh, we have been working closely with uh, Sudbury Valley trustees so far. They've been really helpful in offering sort of a, a counterpoint or a different perspective in drafting this um, from the perspective of an, an entity that is a grantee and that holds many, many conservation restrictions. Uh, and once the grantor and grantee or grantees have essentially come to terms on what they think uh, covers the conservation restriction that they had in mind, uh, now you have to go to the state and the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs will review the conservation restriction and ultimately sign off on it. And the town's own Board of Selectmen will ultimately sign off on it as well. So. Um, that's the framework basically. As I said, we're working here now kind of at that first stage to draft this and get it to a point where hopefully very early next year we can bring it to EEA to get them involved in the process and start to get their feedback and really start to, to narrow it down to a conservation restriction that all parties that we need to be uh, on board with the conservation restriction will be happy with. So that's, that's my brief overview. I hope that was relatively understandable for everyone. I think um, so. Yeah, um, I'd like to just clarify a couple of points quickly. Sure. So, in this case, the grantor is the property owner, which is the town, and after you put the conservation restriction on it, they get to use that property to the fullest capacity that the conservation restriction allows. They still have the land, they can do whatever they want as long as it's allowed in the conservation restriction. The holder of the CR, their obligation is to make sure that what's written in the conservation restriction is upheld in perpetuity. So that whatever is in that conservation restriction, basically their sole job is to check it out once in a while, make sure it's up to the same condition that the conservation restriction requires, and if it's not, to take action to ensure it gets um, put back or you know into the condition it needs to be. So basically, two very different roles. One is the owner uses the land as allowed by the restriction, and the holder makes sure the restriction is upheld in perpetuity or ethics. So having said that, our next agenda item is the golf course survey and property layout. Some of these documents we just got, I don't think there's a lot to go over. You know, there'll be time if you want at the end to look at it if you haven't already. But basically what we have is, if you look to the far left, that is a survey plan the surveyors did. We finally had, we got this at our last meeting. So it shows exactly where the land is. If you remember in the um, town meeting Warren article, I think it was 60 plus or minus acres. Well, now we know exactly how many. And that was important because if it was a lot less, we might have run into a problem. And I think it came out at 59 point something something. So it's close. Um, this is a GIS overview. And then as we got here at 7 o'clock, we came across, we had just been given the first time the committee seen this, the conceptual plan. It shows the golf course with the public safety, which isn't written in stone yet because the permitting has not been finalized but where the public safety is going to be. And we heard at our last meeting, the first time I heard this, was that the public safety parcel is going to be separated from the rest of the golf course by a process called, it's a subdivision A and R, because it's got road frontage approval not required. That will go into one parcel, and the remaining land of the golf course will be in a second parcel. Why this is important is there are some uses 
on the golf course portion that are not consistent with the conservation restriction. The septic system for Woodward <coughs> School and the public safety building, the golf clubhouse, because the CR does not allow building, that's an exception, the parking, the maintenance building, and also the CR allows golf on the footprint of current, current footprint of the golf course. Because of the public safety, two holes will need to be removed and reconfigured. I'll let um, Andre speak to that in a minute, but this all goes together. Where they are being moved is outside of the current footprint, and it will require removing some trees, so what's, that's not allowed in the CR. Um, so the maintenance building, the clubhouse, the parking, the septic system, and the reconfiguration of the golf course all have to be put in what's called an envelope. It's so that this area is set aside within this conservation restriction and separate uses can be allowed there. So is that understandable? Okay, so that's, that's important. We haven't, you know, like I said, we've just seen it, and those envelopes will also need to be surveyed and delineated specifically so that where you have the parking lot, that can't later ooze out into non-parking lot envelope. And it's the same thing we've done at um, Chestnut Hill Farm, where the farm stand, they had, a, they had an envelope where they could put a barn. You know, anything that's in that envelope can be put there, but not elsewhere. And Andre, do you want to talk just briefly about the, uh, the golf course yeah. layout? Sure. <clears throat> so this is the, um, a map showing the existing golf course. And to orient yourself, this is uh, uh, Route 85. Uh, this is uh, Lattice Guama. And then this is the area, this is the reservoir. And uh, so this is the, actually the uh, uh, layout of the uh, present golf course. Uh, so what we have right now, presently, is the existing clubhouse, which is uh, located uh, roughly in this area. Uh, we have the existing first tee, which is right about here, and the ninth green, which is right about here. And the reason that's important, why I mention it, is because uh, those are the main items that will be impacted by the new public facility breaking ground uh, next spring. So in other words, we're going to have to make accommodations for that in order for the golf not to be interrupted. And uh, so the priority really should be to uh, uh, dig a foundation for the, uh, for the clubhouse, and move the clubhouse, create a parking for the golfers uh, to park, and also hook the clubhouse to septic, lighting, power, water, and to make it functional. So this really has to happen before the, the bulldozer even starts on the main building because golf has to maintain uh, continuous operation without interruption. So that's, that's our plan. How that will all work out, we still have to uh, iron out because there's certain details, certain financial aspects which haven't been uh, finalized yet, which may impact this whole project. But essentially, uh, as Freddie said, once we start doing that, we're going to be on conservation land. And uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we have language in the conservation restriction which will cover all this work that needs to be done. So. Uh, in, a, in a temporary situation, I'll get, I'll get to the bright green spots in a minute, but in a temporary situation, we'll have to relocate the ninth green um, in temporary fashion, perhaps somewhere around here, and uh, relocate the first tee, perhaps somewhere around here in temporary fashion, to be able to maintain play. I think we can do that in a way that will still make golf appealing in a temporary fashion. I, I think the majority of people that play golf, they're just out there and they're really they're just out there for the golfing experience, and uh, I, I don't think it will be an issue in terms of, uh, you know, turning down the leagues or, or leagues turning us down because of that. You know, this profit generating uh, income that we need to establish. So that's that will be the first phase, and that has to happen quite quickly. Um, the second phase eventually will be to make the what I call the golf course whole again. That means make the golf course really the gem that it is today, 
with exciting holes that all have their unique look and feel. And they really make it interesting for golfers. And that will require uh, the relocation of the first tee into this corner next to the clubhouse. Uh, right here, sorry, right here. This will be the new putting green. And uh, a relocation of the ninth green up here. So rather than having a ninth green over here, we're going to make it like a, uh, what they call a dog leg right, an up tilt shot, a nice green. It's a beautiful location for a new green. It'll be a super exciting hole. It'll be somewhat shorter in length than the current uh, hole, but really not anything uh, that is going to be offset by the the really challenge that this hole will offer for golfers. It'll be, it'll be really special. And then as far as the first tee is concerned, it's going to be over here. and, and uh, We've stood over there in this spot, and it really, really presents a, a terrific view of the golf course uh, as it, it was intended, you know, 100 years ago when this first, the golf course first got built. It really just takes the lay of the land and makes a golf course out of it. It was a, a tr tremendous idea to put this first tee there, and we credit the uh, golf course architect that was hired for the project come up with this, this plan. These are his ideas and we really, we walked the course with them and we really, uh, really uh, 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 adopted them readily. So, and, and then the yardage for the first hole will be exactly the same as it is currently. So no loss in yardage, it'll be perfect. So, and those really are the only things that are, are, are being impacted. Really the location of the ninth green and the location of the first tee. Everything else stays the same. So I think for me the really important thing right now is to make sure that public facility aside, all of this land we need to put un under a conservation restriction in perpetuity. And that's really number the number one goal. And then afterwards we can figure out uh, how to in, uh, accommodate a golf course. And uh, with the help of uh, Attorney Roger, we've been able to formulate a, a, a draft of a conservation restriction, which, which I think does it beautifully. So that's basically it. Do you have any questions? Yes? <coughs> During the first phase, where would golfers park? Uh, they would park <coughs> in, a, in, the, uh, in this area right here, right, probably right where the ninth green is, next to that, to that uh, wall. There's an area there that's been uh, delineated uh, which, with access to Woodward School currently through a loop road, uh, loop road and uh, it'll be close to the clubhouse. This is the, the ideal place where cars will park. So in, with enough parking spots to uh, uh, closely match what we have today in terms of parking. So that's important, parking, clubhouse, because the clubhouse, the reason why it's so important for the clubhouse to be, to be uh, part of this is, uh, and the foundation to be done is because we want electric carts to be stored under the golf uh, clubhouse as they are today uh, because that saves space. You know, the clubhouse currently is about 1,800 square feet, and all the carts go right underneath the, uh, the clubhouse, and they're electrically charged. If we want electric carts, we don't want any gas-powered vehicles on, the, on conservation land, so we want to maintain that. In order to do that, it's crucial that we get the foundation built, a dug, and then we move that clubhouse, and then we create that parking, hook it up, and then we're good to go. Because the management, uh, the management uh, company that will be operating the golf course, they are tasked, per their contract, to come up with a temporary first tee and a temporary ninth green. So they're going to take care of that. That doesn't won't cost us anything. But still to be determined is the, the cost uh, who will bear the cost uh, for this particular uh, phase of the project. So that's something we're working with right now. We have a golf course committee meeting going on right now where this is being discussed. But I felt better to uh, attend here and present the golf course, represent the golf course at this particular meeting. Yes, ma'am. The uh, current access to the golf course is, is it to the right of where I'm seeing what you described as the Woodward School access? Yes, that's correct. Uh, once you just pass the Woodward School, the entrance uh, is off of 85 right to the, to the left. This is the current access. Oh, that's the current access. The current okay. access is right down here. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's the same road? Yes, okay. essentially, yeah. So thank you, um, Andre. I think that's very um, Sorry, I lost my word. But it was a very good um, overview of the golf course um, plans. And we're not the golf course committee, so as far as the where everything's going to exactly end up and how that's going to happen, um, you're still working on that. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I know we're here to have a public forum, so I really want to get to hearing all your comments, but we asked um, attorney Luke Luke <laughs> I'm really, I'm going to have to take the hat off. Um, sorry. Uh, to give an overview of this CR. And it's been on the website. I'm sorry, we just, you know, got it. So it's been on since Friday. It's still on the town's website. And um, this is in case you haven't had a chance to really review it. They'll give the high points. And there's also the were, maybe still are, copies on the back table. Sure. Thanks, Freddie. Uh, yeah, so I won't uh, belabor anything here too much, but I think we'll just run through really quickly sort of what the different pieces of this are. And if anybody has any questions about anything specific, um, please feel free to jump in. So as I mentioned before, the typical conservation restriction really essentially prohibits all uses. And as I said, what we're dealing with here is fairly unique because typically operating a golf course on a piece of land that's protected under conservation restriction would be an absolute no-no. Um, it's not entirely unprecedented. There's one golf course in the town of Newton that is protected by a conservation restriction. Um, so we looked at that conservation restriction as kind of a model to help inform us as to what EEA, the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, has accepted in the past what would be agreeable. Uh, we've taken a lot from that CR, we've left a lot out, we've changed a lot to really fit the situation here and suit the town of Southborough's particular needs. But um, as you see sort of at the outset, we have this fairly lengthy statement of history and statement of purpose, and that's where we have all these whereas clauses uh, going on to the Sixth, fifth, or sixth page. Um, that's not in. That's not in the copy oh, that's yeah. printed here, but it's okay. in the copy that's online. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so at any rate, right, I mention it only because it's not. It's fairly atypical to have those in a conservation restriction. You generally wouldn't see those, but because this is such a unique situation, we think it makes sense to have those right up front. They're not binding provisions, so the fact that the copies you have here don't include those really don't matter. And frankly virtually all of them are repeated elsewhere later in the document. Uh, but naming those right up front, again, just helps to put this in context. It helps to explain why this is an important piece of property, how the golf course is unique, and why it would qualify for a conservation restriction, and why the town wants to put this land into a conservation restriction. So that's essentially what we're doing there. Um, so I guess you are probably starting off with uh, now, therefore, no all men these presents. Bradford clause, is that? Yeah. I'm just trying to see where you. Purposes, yeah. Um, you don't have the. It goes from one to six. Yeah. Okay. So, six. okay. so the Bradford clause and then into the purposes um, is really where we start to lay out in that purposes section the specific reasons for which this property would qualify for a conservation restriction. And this is going to be really important for that state review. When EEA looks at this, they have 10 or 12 kind of factors that they will look at and consider, and you need to check a number of those boxes and able to really qualify for a conservation restriction. Okay? If you have a really beautiful piece of land out behind your house, but it's private property, and it's bounded on all sides by private property, and nobody can see it unless they come into your house, that's probably not going to be able to get a conservation restriction placed on it because there's no public benefits. Okay? So that's really what we're laying out here. Um, so you see open space preservation, water quality protection, historical and cultural purposes, protection of scenic resources and vistas, protection of wildlife habitat, passive recreation, public access for limited active recreation, that's golf, uh, furtherance of state and local government policy, protecting natural open space. These are all the types of uses or purposes 
that check those boxes that I was talking about. So all we're doing there is really going through and listing out uh, for everybody's benefit who would ever look at this now or any time in the future, and especially for those folks uh, at EEA. Okay, here are the unique qualities and characteristics that this property has that, again, really warrant the conservation restriction being placed here. Uh, the third section, Roman numeral three, prohibited acts, uses, exceptions thereto. This is what I was mentioning earlier. A conservation restriction, essentially what you do is prohibit everything. And that's essentially what we're doing here. As you read through these, I won't go through them point by point, but you'll see, I think if you look at them in their entirety, they're essentially saying you can't really do much of anything out on that land. So that's in uh, B, and then C, is the reserved rights and exceptions, otherwise prohibited. Uh, that is where we, as I said before, start to claw back the rights to use the property in certain ways. So that's where we really get into uh, you know, a lot of detail on specific things that one could do out there in terms of maintenance of a golf course, operation of a golf course, passive recreation. Um, and again, we don't. I'm not gonna go through these one by one, but that's the idea there, and that's really uh, what we all have been working, I think, hardest on is that particular section of this draft conservation restriction because that's really, that's really the nuts and bolts of it. That's the, the, all the rest of this um, kind of comes from the EEA template. EEA has their model conservation restriction. They really don't want you to stray very far from the terms of that. Uh, this one section is the one spot where you get a little leeway because every conservation restriction is a little bit different. Again, this one's quite different. Um, so there's a lot of things listed in here that you typically wouldn't see. But again, we're uh, needing to s reserve the rights to operate a golf course out there, which is, again, pretty, pretty unique. Um, so that is a, a lengthy section, as you might expect. Um, towards the end, we get into uh, discussions and descriptions of passive recreational activities that would be allowed on the course. The idea in drafting this was that we want to allow passive recreational uses when the golf course is not in use. So in the winter, when there's no golfers out there, we want the public to be able to go out, snowshoe, cross country, ski, hike. Um, when golf's being played, it's gonna be reserved for golf. But even if there's a temporary stop and play for whatever reason, the public would have these rights again. And then moving on in the future into per in perpetuity forever, should the golf course cease to exist, these passive recreational uses will be allowed forever. Um, so getting out of that sort of on the other side, really um, a lot of this is probably not so exciting and is really more just kind of legal boilerplate type stuff. Notice and approval, again, a lot of this is just standard taken from the EEA model. Not a whole lot we can do with it in terms of changing it all that much. Um, we did build in here um, on page 24 of my copy, uh, at the bottom there, a management plan. Okay, it's E, a manage management plan. Um, the idea there is to try to help with the administration of the conservation restriction. As Freddie said, you essentially have the grantor, in this case the town, operating a golf course out here and allowing passive recreational use. You have the grantees. As drafted right now, the Conservation Commission and Sudbury Valley trustees, who are essentially making sure that the town is doing everything it needs to do under the terms and conditions of this CR. Um, and so the, the management plan, the idea there was to try to help uh, ease administrative burdens and streamline that process by establishing right up front a management plan that's going to really set forth what I'll call kind of the best, best practices for all different types of, uh, all different aspects of this golf course use. And the idea is once a year, the town, um, through a representative and Sudbury Valley trustees and a member of the CONCOM could sit down, go over the management plan. Is everything working well? Does this all still make sense? Have there been any new developments? Like maybe there's a new uh, herbicide or pesticide out there that's really environmentally friendly. And we haven't been using it yet, but we want to be able to use it. We can talk about that. Maybe now, we, you know, one day we can get solar golf carts, and we've never used those before, but we want to use solar-powered golf carts. 
you know, these types of things would be discussed at that annual meeting, as well as, uh, you know, if the golf course foresees any work that they're going to need to do that they'd otherwise need permission for, that's an opportunity to talk through that stuff as well. So you really just, the idea there was to, like I said, ease the administrative burdens on everybody involved. Um, beyond that, again, I think really most of this stuff is pretty straightforward. Um, not so exciting to read. Uh, a lot of it, again, just sort of legalese slash stuff that's just built into the EEA model that we really can't mess with very much. I'm certainly happy to answer any specific questions about that stuff, but I don't know that it's really worthwhile to, to go through it kind of point by point. So that, I think, is a basic overview of the conservation restriction that we've drafted. We're still working on it, but I think we've made a lot of really good progress here in the past few weeks. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that anyone might have now, or as we go along, if something comes to mind, I'm not going anywhere. So thank you, Luke. Sure. Um, <laughs> so much, so much easier. Yeah, so much easier. Um, so now we come to the public comments, questions, and recommendations. And this is your time to give this committee feedback and then we can consider and discuss and see if we want to have that included or if anything in the CR change. And it's also for you to voice you know, any of your concerns or ask questions. And I think um, because this committee's been not a hearing typically type committee, we're, we're usually very casual and you know, we're going to give us a little direction. So. I'm going to call on people who raised their hands and ask that you identify yourself and your address. And then make a comment. We have um, a board here. We'll write down anything so that you'll know that we're hearing you. And then those will be in our minutes as well. And then if you have a specific question for a specific person, you can ask me and I'll, I'll let them answer you um, through the chair. Uh, it's a way of keeping order, and so we won't be having back and forth conversations all over the place. Um, and then, of course, I'll, if anyone on the committee has a comment they'd like to make, I will call on them and let them do so. Okay? So, did anyone want to go first? This is really up to you. John? John Gobron. John Gobron, uh, 9 Last Farmer Road. And this is not so much a question on, on the discussion we'll be having, but it's more of a procedural question. What happens? With the committees get together and make a recommendation, you can maybe tell me or us what happens from there. Well, from there we make a, we, I believe we're writing a report on you know the CR where we stand with it because we've been, we've been charged to be done by January first, and our first meeting was November sixth, and that time frame included Veterans Day. Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we've been working really hard, which is why you have a meeting tonight with three other, me a total of three meetings discussing the golf course. So I can't guarantee. Our plan is that our next meeting is our last meeting on the 18th. Whether we'll be completed, I won't know until that night. But the goal would be then we write a report to the selectmen on um, our opinion on the this conservation restriction, and also we've been charged. Um, there was a sheet of paper there Sorry. on the back table. It has our charge. I'll read that. Um, the Golf Course Conservation Restriction Committee charge. The committee shall prepare the draft conservation restriction in consultation with town council and CR special council for the property known as St. Mark's Golf Course. Luke is the CR special council and make recommendations for items to be included and or excluded in the CR consistent with a vote taken under Article 1 of the March 8, 2017 Special Town Meeting. The committee shall make recommendations on who should hold the CR. The committee shall hold at least one public hearing in order to receive comments from the public on the terms of the CR. We're doing that tonight. The committee shall prepare and present its draft CR to the Board of Selectmen at a public meeting within the terms of their appointment. The committee shall communicate with town departments, officials, and other resources as needed. So that's our charge. Um, and then once we hand it over to the selectmen, I, 
I think it's in their hands for them to move forward with, you know, <coughs> considering our recommendations, taking them or not, and then finalizing the CR, asking someone to be the holder. Um, I think that's backwards. They would ask someone to be the holder and then um, finalize the CR. And then it goes to, once everything's all set, and there could be negotiations at that phase where the holders of the CR want changes, the town doesn't want them. That's a negotiation process. We have not been involved in that. It's not our place. Um, and then it goes to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, who will see if it meets their criteria to be a bona fide conservation restriction. And that review can take many months. So, does that answer? Very well, thank you. Anyone else? Sue? Uh, Sue Bell, 28 Lattice Road. <clears throat> I think it's great that Sudbury Valley Trustees has stepped up to be uh, grantees with the, with the Conservation Commission, and I think it's very important that we have grantees who are not the town. I understand there's some move afoot to make the town both grantor and grantee, and that doesn't make sense to me. How can the town protect itself from changes? Or how, how can the town check itself out and need somebody else to do that? So I think that's very important. So. I don't think it's the place for us. We haven't voted on it yet, so I don't think I'm necessarily going to address who should hold it in that way, but I want to clarify one thing is that Sudbury Valley trustees have not been asked, but they have indicated that they are willing to consider holding the conservation restriction if asked. Now, the willing to hold means they can't say right now that they absolutely will hold it because it depends on what's in the restriction and if it meets their mission and their obligation to their board and members. So, but the fact that they're willing to consider if asked the, is a big deal because they hadn't um, originally been so inclined. That was a newer development that we were notified of just the, a few days before our first meeting which changed the conversation I certainly had in this committee. Um, they have graciously allowed an employee to attend our meetings, you know, spending their time and you know, their resources on you know, providing information to us and helping with our review at our request without any, well, you're going to be asked. They don't know, we haven't promised anything, um, but they have been very helpful. So, does that answer your question <coughs> or your comment? It doesn't, you didn't have a question, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, oh. I, just, I just think that it's important that the grantor and the grantee be two different organizations. Okay. Walt Lapp on 144 Main Street. Can the sale of the land from St. Mark's to the town go through without this? CR in place? Yes. And then how do we guarantee that after it's sold to the town, that the town will, will, will have a CR similar to something like this? Well, I'm going to answer that because the Open Space Preservation Commission drafted the amendment for town meeting that the selectmen adopted and presented and that was voted on. It was a compromise position and many of you in the room I know were well aware of um, the different interests there. The public safety building, the golf course, and the open space. And it was a compromise position for many people. Not just the, you know, the people who wanted the whole golf course preserved, the people who wanted um, the public safety and then a building lot and you know, the golfers who wanted a golf course. So it was a compromise that everyone bought into at the end and town meeting passed. The language in the CR, I mean, for the CR in the Warren article, um, you'd have to have town council describe what the obligation is, but I think there is a level of public trust that it will be followed up on. I certainly believe it will be. Um, 
I don't know what the consequences would be if it weren't. Um, originally, the, con the Open Space Preservation Commission had language that the building permit for the public safety couldn't be issued until the CR was recorded. And we got strong pushback from the selectmen who said, you know, you can't be holding up the building of our public safety until that is done because it can take months in review. And we agreed that we would make a different timeline, but there's no, you know, it, there's no um, stick or, you know, there's no, there's no ultimate, you have to do it. So it, there's a time deadline by July 1st. Um, and I think it's just July 1st, 2018. That's the deadline to have this CR in. It is. And that's a little bit, um, you know, I think if the conservation restriction is formalized and I should say finalized and presented to the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, they review it. Sometimes they'll send it back, you need another draft in. But as long as it's in the review process, it's not quite recorded, so as long as that process continues, you know, I'm hoping for July 1st, but if it was still under review, because it can take them six to eight months. Did, didn't we vote at town meeting that this whole thing would be done when we bought the land, the CR had to be on it? Well, no, I, I don't trust the, some of the selectmen, okay? Okay. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but it's a I, I, we voted in town meeting that this should be part of the sale, and, and the sale is now, a lot of things have changed. Well, let me just, and I don't know if there's still copies there. Yep. The actual language of the vote sets, and I'll just read this, um, portion a portion of said parcel consisting of not more than six acres, more or less, shall be acquired for a public safety complex, which complex shall be substantially the same as shown on the unrecorded concept plan, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, all of the remaining land shall be preserved in its natural, scenic, and open condition, and to permit passive public recreation use, golf course use, and for general conservation purposes subject to a perpetual conservation restriction approved by the Commonwealth's Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, sorry, Affairs, upon such remaining portion of above referenced parcel of land pursuant to the provisions of MGL's C, chapter 184, section 31 through 33 as amended. With respect to which the Board of Selectmen shall engage the services of an attorney specializing in conservation restrictions, who shall work in conjunction with Town Council and the Open Space Preservation Commission as advisors to draft a conservation restriction, which restri restriction, sorry, which restriction shall be negotiated by the Board of Selectmen, said conservation restriction shall be recorded with a registry of deeds prior to July 1st, 2018. So, that says the restriction shall be recorded prior to July 1st, 2018. It doesn't say prior to purchasing the land. It's a condition of the vote to purchase the land. I don't think we're making that deadline because it won't be, I mean, it's, I shouldn't say that. It takes six months, at least because the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs has a long um, wait time or review period. So I don't think that means that this isn't required if it doesn't, but I think we need to be, you know, we're all going to be paying attention. So, so um, isn't it true that you have to own the property before you can write a conservation restriction on it? Yes. There's no way to do it before we, before we owned it. Right. That's true. David? Yeah, David Perry, 20 Main Street. My, I want to start off by saying, you know, um, Andre presentation of the golf course is just so extremely encouraging. You know, all this negativity about how we couldn't do it. And here we just have, in a, just a month's work, 
you know, just a magnificent reorientation of God of T1 and A. It's really, really attractive. So this God that really can work. It can make money out of operations, you know, maintenance and operations. It's just fantastic how you've done that in such a short time. I'm really just blown away by it. It's really, really encouraging. As the CL, I mean, I endorse this comment made by the lady in front of me, that, you know, to have an outdoor, an out, outside agency like uh, Sudbury Valley Trustees enforce this because, you know, we know in this town things don't get done right. And we need a, we need a strong enforcement agency. I, I thoroughly endorse that. But I want to ask, <coughs> I want to ask you, this is a question and comments, isn't it? Not just comments, it's questions and comments. Because I read something in the in the My South, but saying there was some controversy, wasn't there, about, you know, I, I don't know, I wasn't privy here, I wasn't at it, but I got this sense that there was some sort of argument going on about the role of Sudbury Valley Trustees or, or South Britain Land Foundation or CONCOM or what. Has that been resolved? Are you all on board with this? So, I'll state that what has been written in the blog is not the um, purpose or conversation of this meeting tonight. The concern you're raising, is there a controversy? Yes, there is. Well, can we talk about it? We can. Um, the issue is that our committee is charged, as I read, by the selectmen to make a recommendation on who should hold the CR. We have not taken that vote. We took a straw vote where we indicated unanimously that we recommended Sudbury Valley trustees to be the sole holder, but town council was not at that meeting and we wouldn't take a vote till he came to our meeting. He came to our next meeting. We again didn't take a vote because he advised that our conservation commission rep, Ben Smith, couldn't vote on this committee until the Conservation Committee Commission had voted to hold it or not, and that he was going to their meeting this last Thursday to um, explain why they needed to be the co-holder, primary, principal holder, with all oversight and legal enforcement obligation, and then the land trust, who he recommended to be the South Broken Land Foundation, to be the co-holder. The South Broken Land Foundation has communicated with me and this board that they are not, that they are happy to have, they prefer, sorry for the exact language, that they defer to. Prefer, sorry, I have two defer, trustees defer. in the room. <coughs> um, they prefer that Sudbury Valley defer. Trustee holds. Defer. 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 defer, sorry. <coughs> now I'm sorry I asked for this to be taped. Um, <laughs> that they defer to Sudbury Valley trustees as the more experienced organization in holding conservation restrictions. And part of our conversation was on the fact that um, SBT actually holds six conservation restrictions in Southboro for a total of 223 plus acres. SBT owns six properties in Southboro, totaling 34.4 <coughs> acres. They've been in business for 70 years, and they own a total in our region. They're in the watershed of the Suasco, Sudbury, and Concord River. They own a total of 77 conservation restrictions on 2,569.76 acres in 21 surrounding towns. That's a pretty good uh, reference. They also, in addition to that, own the fee interest on 2,299 plus acres on 89 reservations in 18 local towns. Um, that's a pretty high standard. And Andre? Uh, they're also working with the town of Maynard, I understand, on a, on a conservation restriction for their municipal golf course. So there's a precedent there as well. So they are turning out to be the, the, the most logical uh, holder of this conservation restriction as far as the town of South Road is concerned. So originally when we were draft, when so I want to be clear who the we is, the Open Space Preservation Commission was working on the draft amendment compromise because originally we had been save it all, 
protect the whole property. Then we came up with a compromise amendment. We researched first to make sure it could be done. And we asked SVT as the logical holder. This was not with any negotiating. It was just, would you be willing to hold? And their original comment was, no, because they don't hold conservation restrictions on golf courses because it's not passive recreation. That was almost two years ago, maybe. And over that time, you know, things have been changing in the golf courses as they are being um, viewed more as, you know, a good fit for conservation restrictions. They're being um, often sold off and either developed, and that's a loss of open space in many of our surrounding communities. So that not only um, had we in made inquiries, they started working on one in Stowe. And actually, um, I had the opportunity to walk St. Mark's Golf Course with um, Krista Collins, their land protection special, specialist, and um, five of their staff members. And they basically were wowed by the, the, con um, the, the conservation values of that golf course. The beauty of it, um, we have provided them the historical significance, all of the open space and rec plans references, and you know the connection to the Burnetts and the uh, Gardner, um, his portrait hanging in, you know, the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, all of these things, the historical vistas, all of these things. But actually being on the land and looking and seeing it, they really were very impressed. So um, we have not taken our vote yet. You know, we had the conversation with all the last meeting um, at the Conservation Commission, he sort of changed his direction to Ben, and at the fact that the Conservation Commission should vote, I raised a concern at our last meeting that if we've been charged, we haven't made a recommendation, and the selectmen haven't decided who to request, why is he going to Conservation Commission directing them to take a vote to hold it. And um, I don't really understand the answer to that. Uh, within his jurisdiction, you know, he's town council. I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to argue that fact. I just, you know, found it a little concerning. Can I follow up? So are you, are you, are you, is your group happy having conservation restriction involved at all, conservation commission involved at all as a holder? Or is there some dissent about that? Like, I'm trying to get to the, what is the issue here? I mean, originally, you wanted Sudbury Valley trustees or someone independent, and Count Council wanted Conservation Commission. Is that what it's about? And now you've got two. Am, am I right here? I can't really understand what it's boiling down to. Are you happy? Ben, do you want to speak yeah. to that? Uh, the, the two co-holders isn't some sort of compromise position. That was Town Council. Uh, uh, put together, uh, before the involvement of Attorney Legere, Town Council put together a draft CR. And within that, he, uh, I guess you could say recommended, he, he drafted it into this, this draft document, that the CR would be co-held by Conservation Commission and SALT. Yeah, that was his, his original suggestion. There has been subsequently uh, discussion about uh, whether it makes sense to have it co-held with conservation or does it make sense to uh, go with, we've been speaking about SBT. Um, and there has been some, some discussion, some disagreement about that. Town Council, I think uh, after his appearance at our last meeting here and uh, at the most recent Conservation Commission meeting, I think we can safely say he is strongly in favor of it being co-held with conservation. Is it worth noting that when the original co-holding proposal was made, Sudbury Valley was was not going to be a, a potential holder? And then they changed their mind, things changed so that had Sudbury Valley been available to be a sole holder back when it was originally written, it's likely there would have not been a, I don't know if you can say that, but it seems like there would have been an obvious option back then, the, double, the dual thing never would have come up. I get that. Can I say I don't know that? What I can say is that the Open Space Preservation Commission, um, in the original draft, our comments, 
said we supported the South Broken Land Foundation and the Conservation Commission co-holding it because the South Broken Land Foundation does not have staff right. and that it made sense to have some somebody they can call at a phone number who's going to be consistent. That made sense. Our opinion changed when SVT came around to being willing to hold one based on their experience, and we have so voted that we recommend they be the sole holder. Now what happens if they disagree? If whom? If uh, what happens if there's a disagreement between the two holders? <laughs> Let me get back to you because okay. I have somebody else who wants to ask a question. I have questions for the attorney. So do you specialize in writing conservation restrictions and dealing with the Executive Office of Environmental Energy and Environmental Affairs? Yeah, uh, my law firm is an environmental law firm. Um, we practice mostly environmental law, some land use law as well. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. But yes, I draft, I've drafted a number of conservation restrictions over the years, work with the EPA regularly on conservation restrictions and other matters as well. Um, so this, this type of work is, is right, right in our wheelhouse. Um, and if you, if you have, once all of this is settled and we have a conservation restriction, regardless of who holds it, are you able to rescind that restriction? Is anyone able to go back down the line if something comes up and change that restriction or take it away? Uh, the, the short answer is, is it's almost impossible. Okay. Um, it could be amended, but any type of amendment, if you look closely at the draft, is going to require all parties to sign off. So you'd need the grantees, as it's drafted now, the Conservation Commission and Sudbury Valley Trustees, you need them to agree in writing to whatever amendments you're proposing. Um, and, it, and talking about you know, somehow rescinding it or getting out mm -hmm. from under it is an incredibly difficult thing to do where you're talking about municipally owned land, like we'll be talking about here uh, when the town comes to own this. Not only do you have the protections of this conservation restriction, Article 97 of the state constitution also applies. Um, to get out from under those protections, you need a two-thirds vote of the state legislature. So it, it's, a, yeah. it's a very, very, very complex process to, to try to get out from under something like this, and it just, it's virtually impossible. Good. And my last question is, is typically, or you know, kind of the best scenario, is there one holder or two holders to a restriction? So I, I'm hesitant to say that there's a best, or uh, you know, because I think it, it really does depend. As I said before, every conservation restriction is a little bit different, and it ultimately just boils down to the interests of the parties and their goals and what they're sort of trying to do. Um, it's not at all uncommon to see co-holders. It's probably more common to have just one grantee, one holder of a CR. But it's not uncommon at all. I know talking with uh, Krista Collins from SVT, who's been here a couple times, Sudbury Valley Trustee co-holds co um, a number of conservation restrictions. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not unheard of. Um, you know, as I say, I, I'm hesitant to say that one is better than the other. I think there's mm -hmm. pros and cons either way you want to go. Um, but, and I, you know, one point I would just make, just to make sure everybody's clear, as we've been talking about the idea of co-holders versus one holder, if the Conservation Commission were to be one of the holders, there must be a co-holder. So it could never just be the Conservation Commission holding the CR. It would need to be the Conservation <coughs> Commission with Sudbury Valley Trustees or a similar organization like that. I won't bore you with the legal details of why, but there's something called the doctrine of merger, which essentially says, if I own the property, I can't then grant myself some rights to it. It all, it all merges together, right? So um, I say that just as a point of clarification mm -hmm. that if the Conservation Commission is involved as a holder, there necessarily has to be another holder, and it has to be an organization like Separate Valley Trustees. So just to be on the record, well, from my point of view, and having attended this meeting and the one with the Conservation Commission, the town has engaged an expert person in the drafting of conservation restrictions to work with you, and our town council is not an expert in that area. And we have a willing expert organization in SVT to manage the land, so I think we would be foolish as a town to not take the recommendations of those who are knowledgeable in the area versus those who think they have knowledge in the area. That's my can, you, can you give your name, please? Oh, Ann Elflin, 26 Lives Thank you, Ann. Uh, 
Um, Kate? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Kate Burke. I live at 14 Birchwood Drive. And uh, my first comment is to really thank the committee and to thank everybody who's put all the time and effort into this. And that includes all of our elected officials. Uh, at the um, special town meeting in March, uh, I happen to be someone who didn't want to have the public building, uh, public safety building on the land. Uh, however, I felt really happy that our town came together and came up with what I felt was a reasonable compromise given all of our special circumstances. And I felt that that one article represented good governance. And from the bottom of my heart, I think that our leadership is going to do the right thing um, when we're going to have this you know, expensive expert building for public safety on that piece of land. I would expect that same tenderness and care of the heart of Southboro, that, that beautiful golf course land that will be placed in conservation in perpetuity, and that we will choose what is going to be the best practice. And if the best practice is a single holder of the CR, so that in perpetuity we don't have to worry about future elected people who may, who may have different ideas than everyone who's in the room today who came to the table and agreed that we really want to do what's best for the town. Um, I'm thinking more along those lines because I'm thinking more into the future. And I would like to come back here in, you know, when I'm 90 years old, that would be in 30 years, uh, and to know that that beautiful land has been undeveloped, passive recreation is going on, it's still pristine, and that it uh, has all those amazing views and habitats that we know today. So from my point of view, I think we're at the, really at the, at, at the point of making an incredible uh, positive decision for our town, and that all of the effort that's been put forward um, has just put us into kind of that sweet spot. So uh, I would just compel everyone who is participating, particularly in the decision making, uh, to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, the gentleman, I don't know your name. <coughs> uh, hi, <coughs> Joe Cruciani, uh, 53 School Street. First, I just want to say, great job getting this far in your timeline, in your time frame, because this, this was a lot of work in a short time, so really appreciate it. My question is just, and this is maybe more for the, the legal side, but does it, why, did, does, why does this have to be done now? You know, like I'm just saying is, why can't we wait until we finish the public safety building, get all the construction done with and over with, and then just map it out and say, this is the part that we're going to protect, this is the part we need to do now. And I'm just, I'm just curious, I mean. Well, first of all, the Warren article gave us a deadline. Okay. And often, without a deadline, things just don't happen. Right. It's easy to, you know, next week. So, um, but the Warren article required it. I mean, it would be, in some ways, easier to know where the public safety is and, you know, where the, the T's are and have it all done. But we had to fulfill the vote of town meeting. And that was done, you know, for a reason at the time, for the compromise, to, in some way, reassure people that the conservation restriction actually would happen because if you leave it open-ended, you know, that could be 10 years, 20 years. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Andre? Yeah, and we also want to keep the golf operating. Mm -hmm. So that's important as well. We want to make sure that golf continues in March or April. That's when the golf season starts. And if the public facility bulldozer doesn't start till May or June or something, that's something that's too far into the future for us. And if the golf course is to be operational, it's going to be in the location, not to interfere with the public facility building, it's going to be building, but it's going to be in a location that's going to be on conservation land. So we need to make sure that whatever work we do there is within the parameters that we write into this document. So it's important to have the document. I just had a, a question for uh, you um, regarding the would it be cleaner to have a single holder for the conservation restriction as far as the approval process for the state? 
I mean, does it simplify things? From the state perspective? Well, um, I, you talk about this review process taking yeah. six to eight months. Is, it, is that going to be something that could tie things up? Like, who has the majority voting rights or, you know, the tie breaks? Yeah, all of that? No, it's, it's a great question. I don't think that is the type of factor that would significantly delay that process. It, it's, a, it's a slow process. It's a lengthy process. There's been a decent amount of turnover within EEA, um, Division of Conservation Services, which is really uh, you know, the division that deals with conservation restrictions. There's been a lot of turnover in recent months and years, and they're underfunded. So it's just, it's a, it, the process has gotten even slower than it used to be. Um, to answer your question, I don't think that's necessarily a factor that would slow this down at the state level very much. But, but certainly, it's, certainly there's no doubt um, that having one holder is just simpler in a number of ways. For you? Well, for me, uh, in terms of drafting it, no doubt. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, if you have two holders, um, then you have to sort of establish the, you know, what I'll call the division of labor, which isn't the perfect term for that. But essentially, you have to map out who is responsible for what. It's not impossible, nothing that hasn't been done before. We wouldn't need to reinvent the wheel to do it. It's not going to scare EEA, to your point. They're not going to be scared off by the fact that they're co-holders. You know, they see CRs like that every week. Um, but certainly, you know, in terms of drafting the actual document, yeah, for, for me, sure, if there's one holder, that's just, it's, it's obvious who we're talking about when we're referring to the grant. And I'll just add, it's also a negotiating point between the two co-holders. It's not just you draft it, they have to agree to what's in the agreement, and they may not, and that can prolong things. Um, go ahead. Well, there's, oh. a, there's, there's just, if I may, just there's another piece to it, which is with the co-holders, my understanding is, because of the level of complexity, first you draft the CR, and then that has to be accompanied by a memorandum of understanding that at a finer, finer grain level of detail, really spells out the individual responsibilities as sort of another layer of complexity that gets added. Right. Yeah, and that's no, that's right. Um, most often, every time I've been involved with a CR where there's co-holders, you would have an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, um, or similar type of agreement, which is essentially a side contract, which does everything that Ben just described. And that would kind of what I was talking about. So we wouldn't have, this committee wouldn't have any role in that. If it's not part of this, this CR, that's something that I, my understanding is would be if it went that route, then the, the selectmen would be negotiating. Well, I think, and I think to Freddie's here. point, it, and it would be the between the holders, really. So let's okay. just say that uh, the way this is drafted now holds, and we have co-holders, co-grantees, the Conservation Commission, and Sudbury Valley trustees. It would really be between the Conservation Commission and Sudbury Valley trustees, and certainly the selectmen would be involved in the discussion as the grantor. But it would be sort of between those three parties, but primarily, I'd say, between the Conservation Commission and SVT to hammer out the details of who's responsible for what. So just to go back to the Warren article, um, it says, the restriction shall be negotiated by the Board of Selectmen. That was with full knowledge that once you have the conservation restriction and it comes out to the selectmen, they're in a negotiating term with whoever is going to hold it. So they certainly, um, if, if the one in front of you said, just pretend it's the final one and the selectmen say, okay, we're good with it, then the people who are going to be holding it will say, well, I don't know about this, or we want this, and then the selectmen might say, no, we're, you know, that's a whole um, negotiating process in itself, and if you have two co-holders, they're going to be negotiating, so the complexity does get increased, and I, I just want to get to you now. Carol Long, Pete Crestwood. Just speaking to the same issue, um, would the CR be contingent on the uh, a memorandum of understanding between the two co-holders? In other words, what, would one have to have that signed memorandum uh, in place and kind of feeding into the inference of the language as to what the selectmen would have to do in the negotiating you were talking about for the CR to go forward. And if the co-holders couldn't 
agree, what would happen? Uh, I think that question was posed to me. Um, you would certainly have that side agreement set before you finalize the, the conservation restriction. And, and EEA would be interested to know sort of exactly, I mean, they may not need to see the final side document, but they, they'd want to know. And you'd have to kind of bake into the CR a little bit a description of exactly what that division of responsibility. So be. could there be some language here, a very brief language that indicated that there needed to be that? Well, I, I think what you'd have is by the fact that you have sort of co-grantees, mm -hmm. um, I think that's just sort of implicit in that. So as I said, I, if, if and when we get to that point, um, and where the committee here hasn't really made a decision and we don't want to put the cart before the horse. We've just sort of left things drafted as they are and we're putting that, that particular piece of it off for another day. But yeah, that's, it would all be happening sort of at the same time. Uh, you would definitely want to have that side agreement in place. Uh, if you don't have that, if there's some dispute between the co-grantees as to who's responsible for what, then frankly you don't really have a CR because you don't actually have the grantees. Mm -hmm. Right. I just want to see if anyone else who hasn't already spoken wants to um, comment. Kate? Yeah, I just have a question. Um, so in terms of the relationship of the Conservation Committee to the town, and the relationship of like funding and staffing, because managing that big property, especially with a golf course, is, a, is, is a fairly significant so, assignment. So, uh, conservation is the holder of a, uh, I will answer your question, um, uh, is, is a holder of a CR on Chestnut Hill Golf Course. And interestingly, because it's a lot of work, um, conservation, in fact, hires SVT to do okay. most of the work there. So, presumably, well, however the, 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 the grantee relationship ends up, that would probably be carried over, and SVT would, um, if they're not doing it as a, as a holder, um, they'd be doing it <coughs> under a contractual basis to do baseline survey and yearly observation and so forth. Um, and then the relationship of conservation to the, I mean, Conservation Commission, we're an appointed commission, we're appointed by the select. Yeah. And funding for? So the same, uh, Town meeting process as, as other town uh, departments. So, a piece of it, um, Krista Collins talked to us about the fact that if they were to be a holder, they would need an endowment, and that endowment would cover um, a baseline documentation. Is that part of the CR, or is it after? The baseline survey will be done before the CR is finalized. So I've seen, and we have uh, members of SALT who have gone out with them when they do their inspections as well as, I actually meant to bring one to as an example. Beth has done it at Chestnut Hill. They go around and they, you know, use GPS to mark all the important corners and other important attributes of the land. They take pictures and there's written description. So that in 50 years, they can go out with this book and say, this is what was in the CR, what was required, what was here then, and s does it still look the same? And there would be documentation, a tree fell down, there was a fire, whatever it is. But, you know, basically they can check in perpetuity that the uh, property is in the same condition as required in the CR. That, that baseline survey needs to be done, and they did it for Chestnut Hill Farm, that Therefore, it's likely that we'd be paying them to do it anyhow. That is included in the dollar amount she quoted us, as is a um, figure for legal insurance, so that you, in case you ever have to go to court, which they never have, but you have to have the funds there to do it if you need to. And there's also the cost of going out annually in perpetuity 
to monitor to make sure it's up to what it needs to be. And what was the so approximate? Can I, can I yeah. just make a statement? This is in comparison to Chestnut Hill Farm. In 2006, when the town purchased the CR on the Chestnut Hill Farm property, it was grasslands and meadows. Today, there's an active CSA. So that transformation has had to be reviewed at every step and turn. So when, when trustees bought the property from the Beals family, the Conservation Commission had to review whether that, you know, what changed in terms of the terms of the CR. When they first started digging in the ground to start, you know, growing their first set of vegetables, the Conservation Commission had to review the terms of the CR. When they expanded to a second and a third field, the Conservation Commission had to review that growth and expansion. When the parking lot, the secondary parking lot was put in, the Conservation Commission had to go back and review the terms of the CR. Any potential expansion, development, change of use needs thorough review and vetting. And that's why it's so, so important to get all of those details in the original CR. And it's going to be a challenge if the town conservation commission is reviewing and approving something that's also owned by by the town. There it's it's going to you know it's going to be a, a, a much more difficult process okay. than having two independent entities. I was going to say and Beth was mentioning the conservation the various things on Chestnut Hill Farm the conservation commission had to do this and had to do that. Really, the, the Conservation Commission, we meet every three weeks or so. The, that work that gets done, really, is done by Beth. Mm -hmm. Beth is the, the only um, conservation staff in, in the townhouse. Um, so all of those same duties would also have to be done on the golf course. And, uh, um, and it would be Beth, who already uh, has an extraordinarily full plate. Um, so the, you know, there was some talk at the conservation meeting. Um, uh, it, was, it was suggested even by town council that that's something that would probably have to be addressed somehow or other um, uh, with added staffing or added finances or something like that. Um, and then to answer Freddie's question uh, uh, earlier, so Krista Collins. Um, it was off the cuff, but she, she gave us a, a rough estimate of what such an endowment would, would cost. And this is an endowment, not just the baseline documentation, but legal protection and, and the, the yearly review in perpetuity forever. And the number was $30,000, which struck me anyways as being an incredible bargain. That's not annually. That's so one, time one time endowment. One time endowment. And the CPC. C, the Community Preservation Committee has a placeholder for some amount of money above and beyond that because we didn't know, just in case, you know, to make sure this could go through, that there would be money available um, in the future. So, um, John, you had another I have a question. Uh, before I ask, though, I would like to kind of echo Kate's sentiment for you know, reading through the conservation restriction as we're here, excellent job in such a tight time frame. Great representation, I feel super comfortable with you're on the town side and the committee side, so well done there. Um, on, on your second your second chart, it looks like you have two things to do as a committee, do the CR and then make a recommendation on the holder. Um, is it your intention to take a vote tonight? No? Our next meeting is the 18th after we have all the information from you. We didn't really, I set the agenda, I didn't really think we'd have enough time to get into the detailed discussion that, that made. Okay, when you do take your vote, there's been a lot of great comments here, Ian and everyone, and it seems to come around a central thing, is that it kind of looks like a duck, walks like a duck. You know, why are we talking about having a second holder? It's more expensive, it's more complicated. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of no, there's a lot of negative reasons to do it, and they all, even when we do have a second holder, they all bleed back to Sudbury Valley anyway. <laughs> so, um, in your notes, in your write-up, are you going to put in the comments that the town people have talked in, or is it just their our recommendation is X? Well, until we actually sit down and discuss and vote how we're going to write it up, um, I would imagine, though, my perspective is I would advocate that it have more descriptive reasoning why we're doing this 
and uh, the, the committee really needs to consider that. I didn't mean writing to it up. Up. But we are also filming this yeah. tonight, yeah. so um, that was one of the purposes, yeah. so that you know people can look back, and you certainly can write letters. I will say though, once we make our recommendation, it goes to the selectmen, and it's just a recommendation. So there's another opportunity to participate. And you're very welcome, everyone, to come back next week. It's, you know, just because this is a public forum doesn't mean all of our meetings aren't public and you're not welcome to come. It just won't be as much back and forth. Um, so I'm Karen Fazio from 46 Flatus Palma Road. I don't want to take a lot more time, but I just want to make it official that I agree with everything that Kate Burke had said previously. And I'm so grateful for all the work that you guys are doing um, to implement what the town voted for in March. I think it's that's so important here. <clears throat> I voted against putting that building on the golf course because that land is so precious and so beautiful and I couldn't imagine it. And um, <clears throat> having the um, CR added um, was so pivotal in so many other people voting yes for public safety. So, I mean, we're talking hundreds of, hundreds of people in the town that voted. That was pivotal. It didn't convince me, but it convinced a lot of people, and I'm now relieved that that's there. So it's so important of what you're doing. We, we have to have that. Um, Andre, I, you, you're doing an amazing job with planning out the golf course, and I have to ask as part of the town leadership's responsibility to carry through the vote of the people, are you going to be um, given the proper funds that you're going to need to implement your plan with, with the millions of dollars that the town will be spending on the public safety complex? I think as part of that is the CR with the golf course. Are you going to have the money to do what you need to do to make it work? Um, we don't know if we're going to have the money yet. Uh, and let me break down the money aspect and uh, the various phases. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to provide uh, figures that are ballpark figures. We haven't fine-tuned them yet. However, uh, when I was talking about the initial phase, uh, which will consist of uh, getting the, car, the course operational so that we don't have to interrupt play, that will require uh, digging a foundation, moving the clubhouse, creating a parking area, and hooking up the various services for the clubhouse. That's just the key elements. Also, temporary locating a uh, locating a temporary ninth green and a temporary first tee. <clears throat> that aside, with first tee and the ninth uh, relocation in a temporary fashion, the the, the rest of the money. Uh, we're talking about roughly three hundred or three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Right about that. That's all we need for that first phase. The only money that's been committed, the only money we have for that, is thirty thousand dollars, and that's the the public facility uh, project has allotted thirty thousand dollars to either demolish the clubhouse, which we don't know, or move the clubhouse. That's, that's, they figure that's going to be $30,000. And so we either demolish it or we move it, but we don't dig the foundation, we don't make the parking, we don't hook anything up. So right now we're kind of in a situation where I'm not quite sure what we're going to do, but we're, we're a little bit, personally I'm a little bit worried um, um, about, you know, that's one thing that we're talking about right now in the other mi meeting, you know, what, what um, you know, what, how do we move forward? We're trying to find some, some funding to get that, that set. Uh, and then the, the future plan, you know, the relocation of the ninth, uh, the, the permanent ninth green and the permanent first tee that the uh, architect is, has outlined, that will require more, more than likely, uh, you know, a, a town meeting of some kind of a warrant uh, article in order to, to get those funds approved because uh, we're talking, uh, you know, a sum that's greater than the $300,000, perhaps, you know, a million dollars or something to cover everything. So, but that's, you know, that's down the road. Initially, we just have to get that part, that initial phase, that $300,000, that's the, that's the key. And if we get that, we'll get the cost of the golf course running. And if we don't get it, and if we stop, if we interrupt the golf play, that's the death knell of that golf course.
that it's going to be an unfortunate situation. And I'll be very sad if that happens. Well, never mind sad. I mean, it seems like it should be, it was part of what people voted for. Well, it, well that's, that's the spirit of the agreement. That, see, when we went in to, the, to this, to this, in, the, in this effort, it was always understood that we're going to have to pool our resource. We're going to have to pool various groups together to get this over the hump. That meant the, the various factions at the time, you know, the open land, the, the people on Gladys Guama, the golf course committee. And uh, because if without our assistance, there's no way they would have been able to pass that bill. Just absolutely no. And they acknowledged that. And so all along, all the conversations, all the meetings we had, there was it wasn't written in a contract anywhere, but there was the, 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 the tacit agreement among ethical and noble people that we would do the right thing. In other words, find some percentage, small percentage in the $30 million budget so that we make sure we keep the golf course operational because we're dependent on them to get our building, you know? And so it's, it's so it was a leap of faith on our part, and uh, hopefully the leap of faith will uh, materialize. So it's, it's, and right now it's not clear that, uh, and it's, so, um, you know, we're, we're on it. I would say, in addition to that, that the Open Space Preservation Commission um, heard lots of comments about non-golfers who wanted the land preserved looking the same it looks today. And our commission believed, as we move forward, that the best way to accomplish that was through a golf course. Because the managed open vistas is really hard to accomplish. I'm on the stewardship committee for Breakneck Hill, and the work that goes into that is tremendous. And I don't see how, I mean, that's kept in a more natural state. I don't know how the town would provide the resources necessary to keep it looking anywhere like it is today. And um, so there's, there's value in the, um, not just the golf, but in the um, historic landscape that, that, you know, it's our heritage landscape that it provides. And there's value in that in addition to the conservation values on the property and the golf course. So. That was a consideration for the non-golfers out there, why the golf course is really important, you felt. David, you've been waiting patiently to speak Yeah, well, again. I just want to piggyback on this last comment from a fellow uh, golf group member down there. I did. Uh, I just think it's so fundamental. Is there anyone who disagrees with what he says? I, otherwise, I think we should all unanimously endorse what you're saying. The town has to come up with 300 grand to make sure this golf course continues in operation, somehow. Yes. Is that the sentiment of everyone in this room? Yes. We should, yes. we should put it on hands. the floor. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, and as you know, that's not in our charge. So <laughs> <laughs> you have other committees and uh, boards to make that point too, and I suggest you know that you know, that you do so. Certainly, we don't have a budget here to ensure that. Um, and neither were we charged to, but um, I'm glad you felt that you can share that information here. Again, televised, other people will see it. We have several selectmen in the room. They're hearing it. Um, but I urge you to go to the proper boards and committees to raise that concern. Kate, again. Yeah, I just, um, I have not heard the argument for why the co-holding is the, be the better idea. Like I haven't heard, I heard uh, Attorney Cipriani uh, articulate that he felt it was a good idea, but I have not heard the arguments. I've heard so many pros as to why a single holder with SVT would be a good idea, um, but I have not heard a compelling argument on the other side of the equation. And I was wondering if either anyone at, uh, in the panel or if any of the selectmen in the room could address that for the public, please. Well, this, to my knowledge, it's not something the selectmen have considered yet, so I don't think asking them to speak to it is appropriate at this time. Um, anyone on this committee have any idea why? 
Well, well, this is a fundamental issue, isn't it? This critical question now comes up. Let's, Let's keep this through the, through the chair here. Yes, okay, through the chair. Through the David, chair. This has David. to be addressed. An answer. We need an answer to this. I Why know. is Our committee is addressing it now, so let okay. us, okay. please. No, I, Andre? I just say that uh, I've had some discussions with uh, the golf course committee about uh, the work that I've been doing on this particular committee in terms of the conservation restriction. And uh, the golf course committee also feels that uh, it is in the best interest of the, the town and the residents to have a sole holder of the conservation commission and for that to be an independent uh, entity and that uh, someone like with the experience and the staff and the, and the uh, uh, knowledge and experience of the Sudbury Valley trustee as an example would be the ideal way to go. That's how the golf course committee feels and that's uh, probably how it will, uh, that will be my recommendation more and more than likely than we, when it comes to a vote. Because yeah. I think it makes the most most sense. Otherwise, you know, I, anything else is, it's almost like you don't want the, you know, the fox and the chicken coop kind of a situation to occur. You know, you know, really, there is no interest in, there's a conflict of interest in having the owner of the land in charge of what they do with the land. And who's to say 10 years from now that somebody in town who's running the town wants to make a polarama on, on a conservation restriction land? I mean, what's, nobody that I know of wants to do that now, but we can't, we have to prevent that from happening. And uh, I think in the interest of the, the, the will of the people on March 8th was that a conservation restriction placed on that portion of the land not occupied by the public facility building. And it's in the best interest of the town, in my view, I think, to have a sole holder of the, of the conservation restriction and to be some an entity like Sudbury Valley Trustees. So then, that, why can't we have that? Why is that, does, why does not not make sense? And that, that really is the way we should go. Because that was the spirit of the, of the, uh, the vote that mm -hmm. we had on March 8th. And, mm -hmm. and, and what you had mentioned, the fact that everybody was conflicted at the time. Nobody wanted this to have the land disrupted by this, this building, you know? But, but we have to face the reality that if we don't make some kind of compromise, which is another reason why we had this leap of faith. Our compromise was, yes, public facility, we're going to help you, but you have to help us too. And so we have to, it's always a compromise. And so it's not, oh, now we got our building, now we don't want anything to do with this. You know, it's, it's in the spirit of the, of the agreement, and it got people to say, oh, well, okay, if we don't do this, then St. Mark's is who knows, we can't prevent them from selling the land to some, some uh, greedy builder that's just waiting to, to, to put up condos up and down La Guama, because that's probably, that's a, that's a likely scenario that would have happened. So what do we do? We have to compromise. We, we came together, and I thought it was an ideal situation where we have, we solved the public facility situation. Maybe not to everyone's liking, but we, we so certainly solved it to the satisfaction of the public facility people. And at the same time, we get most of that rest of that land, keeping it in a pristine fashion, and under which a golf course uh, uh, can continue. I think, why, why can't we do that? We can do that. We can do that. So, you're here. Samantha <laughs> Barney. Um, I will add to that that the Open Space Preservation Commission had a meeting last Tuesday, and in it we unanimously voted to support SVT as the sole holder and as their representative to this committee. That would be how I would vote. Um, I will say that our consideration is what, the only comment I really have heard that was written in letters that um, are public record from town council. It's in the town's best interest. And our commission decided that our role as charged by town meeting to facilitate the preservation of open space, that is our job. The town's best interest, when you have a conservation restriction, you give up the rights the town chooses at the time of entering into it, which rights they're giving up then the obligation is to ensure that restriction is upheld. And in our job as facilitating the preservation of open space, 
we believed it was imperative that we vote what we felt accomplished that, and we felt there were too many conflicts, too many, you know, maybe budget would help um, the Conservation Commission accomplish inspections in the future, maybe it wouldn't, maybe they'd have the resources to fight a um, encroachment done by the town, maybe they wouldn't, um, who knows, but with SVT and their experience, we felt that was the best, that was our vote, and um, so that's another representative on this committee. Bonnie pat her hand up. I'm sorry, I don't want anyone to think that, I don't know who else is in the room, but I'm not here to avoid questions. We have not received a recommendation from any of the member boards or even this board yet. So it'd really be unfair to say anything. One Just my concern is, is that at the board of selectmen meeting last week though, a couple of selectmen went on record saying that they favored that the town would be a holder of the CR. And that concerns me because the voters of our town voted at town meeting to have the warrant, to have a special committee appointed, to bring expert consultants in to have the discussion. Um, in a similar way, I'm an emergency physician, and if you're having a stroke and I bring a neurologist to the bedside to give me recommendations, uh, I am going to really listen carefully and most likely work with my consultants and take their advice. Um, I was just concerned because there's expert advice being rendered, yet decisions are already being rendered and have gone on the public record. Right. So it's concerning to me because I have not yet heard other than Attorney Cipriani say that it's in the best interest of the town to hear a cogent, well-articulated, clear set of reasons that in a debate format, I would agree that you made a point. I have not heard them, and I am still waiting to hear them. And when we received the recommendation, I, I was here the evening Sudbury Valley was here, so I was part of that discussion in this room as well. But I'm waiting for the recommendation. I might find something in it that could be unsettling to me, that I would want to bring to your attention as well. Sure. I'm going to turn it over to Ben now. Just, just um, on that issue, I was sort of looking for that from Attorney Soprano also in the, the conservation meeting. And uh, um, so in, in putting together this draft CR, so we're, we're doing two things. We're, of course, uh, identifying the, uh, um, the conservation and, and recreation values of the property, but we're also it's an agreement between two parties. We're also working to protect the town's interests. That's the other half of the CR. And uh, if you read through the whole thing, there there are two halves to it. And hopefully, the the rights that Attorney Cipriano is 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 concerned with, that it is worried about not being adequately represented or whatever, if those can be articulated, they can be included within this document so that those rights can be protected. And we can we can have them written out in a forthright way, memorialized in perpetuity in the in this document. And if we could if we could get that portion argument, we could include it in here and, and it could be taken care of um, um, regardless of who the holder of the, the CR is. Okay, I have a comment. David Parent. I want to pick up on this and you know that's I think, <coughs> totally agree with this lady here, um, Kate Burr, I think you're absolutely on. I think there's a, an effort here to put Conservation Commission in there which shouldn't be in there. I think the sentiment of this room is they shouldn't be in there. SVT should run this thing. Now, is that the sentiment of this room? Does anyone in the public, since this is a public comment, disagree with that? Because I get the sense that everyone this side of the table believes that it should be SVT, period. Anyone disagree with that? Let's get it on the record. Unanimous? No. Okay, no. Who disagrees? We don't have you're you're not on the board. You, you, you know, you're a board of selectmen. You have to vote I, later. Hello. I'm going to cut this off yeah. at this point. No, I, I I, to get on the I'm the record. chair. I'm the chair. This is public comment questions okay, I'm and input. For a, I'm but it's not the public vote 
in the room right now, okay? We're not having a vote of the public. You all as individuals are here to ask this committee questions, give your input, and to give any comments you have, and we are taking that and happy to take it. But this is not a public meeting vote. It's a comment session. Co and it's not right. a public meeting vote. You've made your comment. Okay. We've heard it. But it is not a vote of the people in this room that are not representative of any type of um, town government or <laughs> group. Besides, you chose to come here tonight, and we thank you for that. <laughs> and we're hearing your comments, but there's no vote happening here on that side of the table tonight. Thank you. Yes, but I just want to make. I want to turn it over I, to I, our okay. attorney right. right now. Did you have a comment? Uh, I was just going to say, and, and I should note, I'm agnostic on the point of who the holder or holders should be. I truly am. Uh, I'm happy to to talk it through, and I mentioned before I see pros and cons uh, to both. I think the one the one comment that I've heard from Attorney Cipriano that I don't know that I've quite heard really stated tonight is that, as I understand it, from his perspective, the reason that having the Conservation Commission as a co-holder is to allow the town to maintain some level or degree of control over this important property that the town is spending a lot of money on. Obviously, where you're placing a conservation restriction on the property uh, and where the Conservation Commission would be a co-holder, you know, the, the amount of power um, that they would still maintain on the property would be quite limited. It would be limited by the terms of the conservation restriction. But I think, at its essence, that's where his advice is coming from. At least that's my understanding, is that it's really more to do with the town maintaining some level of control as to what's happening on the golf course, um, you know, from, from now forever, you know, in, into forever. And, and I think the other piece of this that is maybe important to keep in mind as well, as well is that Sudbury Valley Trustees is a great organization. They're certainly extremely well qualified. No, no one is disputing that. Um, but nobody knows what the future holds. And I, I know that Attorney Cipriano has, has said at least once that I can recall, the town of Southborough is not going anywhere. So sort of from a longevity perspective, um, I think it's really a matter of having the town be able to maintain some control and have that certainty of knowing who at least one of those holders is going to be truly forever. Um, I think those were kind of the two primary points that I've heard from Attorney Cipriano here in this room um, that to me makes sense and that I just want to make sure everyone here hears um, because I, I haven't quite heard those things said in that way. And, and you're correct, I have heard that. Um, our commissions, the Open Space Preservation Commission's viewpoint on that was when you enter into a conservation restriction, that is when you are giving up certain rights. And the holder of the CR is to ensure that this conservation restriction is enforced or upheld. Having control over that just didn't make sense to us because you give up your rights when you enter into the agreement and the goal is to ensure that what you entered into the conservation restriction is forever followed. SVT going away, it can happen, who knows? You know, they've been around for 70 years. I certainly think that the, what was the number there? The uh, 21 surrounding towns, with 77 conservation restrictions, um, those you know that's some level of confidence that other people have placed their confidence in SVT. Additionally, they will have a document of is it succession? What happens if, in any crazy chance, they were to go under or no no longer exist? <coughs> somebody else who would be willing to take on the responsibility. We've had some discussions because it's adjacent to DCR. That could be a, a really not, that's a negotiating beyond our, um, you know, until they're asked, they're not going to go looking for who's going to take over if they went under. But that is common practice, best practice. I don't know if it's required in the CR. To actually specifically say who this is, I don't think that that's really required. But I, it I've happens, heard from, it happens pretty routine. I've heard from Krista that she would, that was how they operate. 
they also, I will say, is there's this group called the, and my land trust people here might know better, the National Land Trust Alliance, Alliance, who has a certification process for land trusts in the country that has a very high standard, takes many years, and is very difficult to achieve. And um, until recently, only a few had achieved that, and SVT was one of the first in this state to be certified. That is another level of confidence that a national group has certified them as being one of the highest standards of um, operation for a land trust. I don't know how many more have been getting it, but it's a very difficult, not easy, year-long <coughs> process to get, many years, I think. Um, Lisa? Lisa Braccio, 13 Oregon Road. Um, I'm also selecting here in town. First, I want to thank you for all the hard work and the dedication that you have all put in to getting this done in such a tight time frame. Um, I'm actually amazed as I've read through the document tonight, and I'm so impressed with what you've done. So I want to thank you very much. I think we put the right group of people together to do this. Um, as many know, I was on the Open Space Preservation Commission when this came forward to town meeting and worked very hard through Freddie, who totally took the lead on this for the Open Space Commission in getting this done. And our priority was having it preserved in perpetuity forever. Um, my position on that has not changed um, in any way. Um, I respect and I put great, put great value on the work you're doing, and that is why we put you in the place you're in. To be able to come to us with a recommendation based on the public forum, which was a very important piece, to be able to hear what everybody had to say and what everybody wanted. So I think this was great tonight. I walked away clearly with some very valuable things tonight, and I appreciate everyone in the audience and everyone at the table. Uh, I appreciate this happening tonight. Um, I place very high value, I can only speak for myself, in the recommendation that you're going to bring to the selectmen, and I'm sure the other selectmen will as well. Obviously, I can't speak for anyone else besides myself. So again, I thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the product that's before me tonight, and, and I look forward to having the recommendation and the discussion uh, that goes along with this recommendation. And I'm sure those of you in the room here tonight will come when it comes before the selectmen as well, and also have your voices heard that night. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to take a minute to say it's approaching 9 o'clock. We still have some other business after this, which of course you're welcome to stay for. But I've been hearing a common theme in the comments, and in the last few moments or minutes before nine o'clock, which I think would be a good time to sort of wind this up. But certainly we'll stay going if more people want to speak. Um, are there any non who's going to hold the CR comments? <laughs> or questions or concerns you would like to raise at this time, having read this document? I'll ask one more question. Um, the current placement of the uh, septic for the school, the public safety, and the golf, unless it's changed, the last draft that I saw had it kind of in the middle of the fairway, if I'm Andre, has that changed? Uh, well, from initially they were. So was that part of? Yes, but it's moved close, it's much closer to, to the, the golf. Well, it's it's actually closer it's to the public good. safety now. Yes. So is that within the envelope of the public safety, or completely, or is that partially in the envelope of the CR? When we talk envelopes, the public safety, well, we've now heard is not an envelope, which we originally had been indicating. Okay. It's now a separate parcel. Okay. Is the, or it will be. The, the Currently today, is the septic in any of the 54 acres referenced in this yes, draft? Yes. So let me ask you this. Is there somewhere that I haven't seen in here that any maintenance, should it fail, or anything else, is it referenced that I did not see in here? I just, there's, there's a placeholder. Yeah. It's, it's, it, okay. I've got a placeholder in So there. it's not actually in the pages I have here. That were here tonight? Yes. No, this okay. is the entire document. I'm not okay. sure. That's fine. I just want to make sure, and I, and I know, I know that you guys probably did cover this, but I, from my standpoint, I just wanted to make sure that there's something in there to protect the, the land that the CR is on uh, in the event that something with the septic or 
may happen? Because you're talking equipment potentially coming on the field. Those envelopes out. that I mentioned at the beginning, yep. they will clearly outline what can be done okay. within that envelope. So the CR envelope yep. will have specific language for septic. Okay. There will be another okay. envelope for the parking and for the clubhouse. And then there okay. needs to be another envelope for the maintenance building, which is um, further up. So all of those non um, conservation restriction type uses will have an envelope and will be individually, I believe, called out what is allowed within okay. there. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any other specific comments on the conservation restriction or general on um, things that are included, not included, should be included? Anyone? So I'd like to thank you for coming. I hope you all have signed in. We'd like to know who was here tonight. I also want to make a note um, to everyone here that we are greatly indebted to Beth Rosenblum, the conservation agent rep on this committee. Anyone who sat on any committee or board or commission knows that the person who takes your minutes is yeah. the unsung hero or heroine. <laughs> Always. Um, in addition, she helped, you know, she helps put this presentation together and has been just invaluable to us. And also, of course, we really want to thank Luke, who's been working really diligent with us on a very tight time frame, getting our comments and getting this turned around every week. I mean, it's really been amazing. So it's been a pleasure working with him as well. Um, did anyone else want to yeah, say anything sure. before we end the public forum portion of our meeting? So, are there refreshments out? Yes, there are.